Okay. Um, and I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, uh, which is Adam Mykolski, who is the Curator of Education at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, so just down the block. Uh, he has a master's in history with a focus on transportation history from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and a BS in urban studies with a focus in urban planning from the University of Minnesota. And he has been passionate about railroad history since growing up near the Chicago and Northwestern Railway line in Wisconsin. So I, I'm, I know some of you on here are uh, railroad museum um, members, so you know Adam, but that sounds like he has the perfect job. Um, because Not if, bad. If, yeah. he, if he loves railroads and he has a degree in focused on transportation history, we lucked out to get him here at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. Uh, so he's going to talk to us today about streetcars and urban lines that move people around the northern Nevada area. So that's the history of transit in northern Nevada as opposed to the history of railroads. I'm, I'm guessing there's a distinction. Well, <laughs> um, so if you could go ahead, Adam, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Mina, um, and thanks to everybody for joining me, uh, joining us tonight for this uh, presentation. Um, this is my first. This is the first time I've actually given a Francis Humphrey lectures uh, series lecture, so um, this is really an honor for me to to do this. So thank you for being here tonight, and thanks to the Nevada State Museum for hosting this event. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, curator, uh, excuse me, uh, California State former California State Road Museum curator and uh, noted Virginia and Truckee historian Stephen Drew for his help on this project for me. Um, I gave this presentation a few years ago um, up at the Sparks Heritage Museum and at the VNT Railroad Conference. Uh, so it's uh, great to be able to present it to uh, Nevada State Museum members this week. So I'm gonna share my screen now. And so the, the title of tonight's uh, lecture is History of Transit in Northern Nevada. Um, I'll try to keep this to about 45 minutes to an hour, so I don't want to keep you here too long. Uh, my worry is that it could go longer than that, so I'll try to dial it back if it's going too long. <laughs> I'll start, you know, signaling you and stuff. Okay. No, I, I won't be that obvious, sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the, the screen share takes a minute. It hasn't come through yet. Okay. Yeah, maybe I should have done this at home because I have much better internet there. <laughs> so you're seeing. Can I, let me see. Is it on there? Okay. No. Did I share it? Okay, maybe I didn't share it. Ah, here we go. Sorry about that. There we go. That was my fault. I'm not the most technologically advanced. All right. Do you see it now? Yes, very yep. good. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so let's see. So tonight's, yeah, tonight's uh, presentation is the history of transit in Northern Nevada. Um, so here are some of the topics we'll cover uh, tonight. Uh, one is streetcars in the Reno Sparks area. Um, another one is interurbans in northern Nevada. We'll talk about some of the lines. The, well, we'll talk about the lines that were proposed and the only line that was ever built uh, in northern Nevada. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, VT VT Transit, which was a transit company that was owned by the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. And then we'll finish up with a brief um, brief history or a brief look at uh, transit in today, transit today in northern Nevada. So uh, Reno at the turn of the 20th century, uh, what was going on in Reno at that time? Well, Reno's population in 1900 was 4,500 and by 1910 it had an, it had increased to 10,867 uh, people. And during that time, mining was, uh, was still a big industry in Nevada, and the Tonopah and Goldfield mining booms were occurring. Uh, rail connections were built to connect Reno 
to the mining businesses there. And uh, also uh, the Newlands project of 1905 was developed uh, to divert water from the Truckee and Carson rivers to Lahontan Valley and Fernley for agricultural purposes. All of this meant more business growth for Northern Nevada. Um, all, so then all of this growth all of this growth eventually helped to shape Reno into a hub for Northern Nevada as well. And um, so then there was also the addition of Sparks. And uh, so Sparks was formed in 1904 with the move of the Southern Pacific Division offices from Wadsworth. And the reason why they moved the division offices to from Wadsworth to Sparks was that um, the, the Southern Pacific realigned their transcontinental route across Northern Nevada. And uh, this helped shorten the route uh, and it necess necessitated the move of the division point from Wadsworth to Sparks. Um, so the Sparks population in 1910 grew to about 2,500 and this was basically because of all the railroad employees that were working at the, for the Southern Pacific at the Roundhouse and their shops and Sparks. Um, so with all this development, there was a need for better public, trans public transportation in Reno and Sparks. So this is an example of a streetcar and this is a photograph of a, a streetcar in Reno at 2nd Street in Sierra. This is probably back around 1907, circa 1907 uh, in that time frame. Um, so streetcars, the history of streetcars basically starts with, um, they, were ended, they were invented by Frank Sprague in 1887. Uh, they were, it, the first streetcar system was installed in Richmond, Virginia in 1888. And streetcar systems were very popular with, civ with city leaders. Uh, streetcars were cleaner than the animal power transit systems of the day. Um, also, the streetcars were more powerful, they were faster, and they were more efficient than animal power transit systems. Um, like one of the big complaints about the animal power transit system was the waste. <laughs> and so you had to scoop up all this waste around town. It, 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 it eventually became such a big problem that there was there were conferences in the 1880s to have uh, to talk about these issues of animal waste in our cities, and but right at that same time, innovation came around where uh, where Frank Sprague had invented these the, the streetcar, and so that eventually over the course of the 1890s, that helped to eliminate that problem of animal waste in our cities, um, and use a clear technology such as electricity. Um, so after the first, uh, first system was installed in Richmond, Virginia in 1888, uh, demand for streetcars grew rapidly. Within three years, over 200 streetcar systems were built or proposed in the United States. And by 1900, 15,000 miles of streetcar lines were built in U.S. cities. Uh, cities widely adopted streetcar technology within a short period of time. So here's an example of an early streetcar and uh, from Reno from the Reno Traction Company. And um, so some of the early streetcar proposals, there was there were several early streetcar proposals in Reno. Um, for example, there uh, there was a proposal of some of the earlier proposals were either mule powered or horse powered, but then later ones, later proposals were electric streetcars. Um, but none of these really ever got, got off the ground. Um, one proposal, there was even one proposal to build an electric streetcar line to the mines at Olinghouse, which is near Wadsworth, um, which would have tra tra traversed through the Truckee River Canyon. Um, that just seems like it, such a far-fetched idea that I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not surprised it never got built. Um, Unfortunately, none of these proposals ever took off. And so none of these early streetcars during the 1890s were ever constructed. Uh, but then in 1904, uh, a streetcar line finally comes to fruition. The Nevada Transit Company uh, constructed a line between Reno and Sparks uh, beginning October 1st, 1904. So this map 
um, this map shows the the Nevada Transit the Nevada Transit Company in Sparks, and so it starts. If you can see my can you see my arrow on the screen? Um, if you can see that it it starts over by the the Southern Pacific uh, Roundhouse, which is basically we're at I-80 in Pyramid Way, where that is today. It's across the street from the Sparks Heritage Museum. And then the, the track would, would have gone up current day um, Victorian Way. And at that time it was Harriman Street, and then after that it was B Street, and it would have gone west along Victorian Way, B Street, then up to the old Central Pacific right of way and then onto 4th Street. And then it would eventually, it would just take 4th Street all the way into Reno. And eventually the, the line would end at the Southern Pacific Railroad Depot in downtown, downtown Reno. And so this is an example of a Nevada Transit Company streetcar. Um, so as workers laid track, three street cars were purchased from San Francisco. And if you look at this car, it looks very similar to uh, a cable car in San Francisco. Well, the cars, uh, the cars are, are believed to have been uh, cable cars converted to street cars. Um, so we believe that um, some of these street cars were actually old cable cars from San Francisco and just converted to uh, streetcars. And the cars were, the, the cars of the Nevada Transit Company were painted a bright yellow color. This is a photo from the first day of operation on the, the Nevada Transit Company. Um, this photo is from Thanksgiving Day, which was November 24th, 1904. And uh, so this was the first day of operation for the Nevada Transit Company. Uh, on that day, the Nevada Transit Company hauled 3,000 riders and the, the rides were 10 cents each. That was just one way between Reno and Sparks. And the rides took approximately 15 to 20 minutes uh, to, to go between Reno and Sparks. And then um, the Nevada Transit Company needed a building to store their streetcars and maintain them. Um, here is a so th here's a photo of uh, of the of a Reno Traction Company car outside of the the car barn that was at Fourth Street and Morrill Avenue in Reno. Um, the cars were maintained at the site, um, it, and the house and the the car barn could store six cars. Uh, today it is the site of a restaurant supply company, and so none of this. Uh, exist anymore. Um, you can just drive past it and see there's a restaurant supply company there. And then eventually um, in 1907, uh, eventually the, the Nevada Transit Company changed their name to the Reno Traction Company. And so this is a map of all of the, the routes that we had here in Reno at one time. So you can see here, this is the 1904, this is the this is the original route. So it would come down 4th Street and then turn here um, at Sierra and then make a left here on the 2nd Street and then make its way down center to the, at the Southern Pacific Passenger Depot. Um, the next route, the next expansion, um, excuse me, the next expansion was this line here, the red, this line in red, this line, uh, the, the company extended south on Virginia Street to Pine Street in 1905. And then in 1906, the line was extended even further down to Liberty Street. Um, next is uh, this purple line here. Uh, so this, was, this track was extended down 2nd Street and it extended all the way to Keystone Avenue. Uh, in 1906. Um, there was a funny story about the inaugural run uh, to Keystone Avenue, which occurred on December 30th, 1906. Um, that night there was a snowstorm 
and uh, it led to poor visibility for the motor for the streetcar operators. And so on the the inaugural run, actually, it got down to Keystone and Second Second Street and Keystone, and then it uh, the cars went off the car went off the tracks and derailed at the end of the line. Um, fortunately, there were no injuries, but um, the line had to be shut down for the rest of the night. And then another car rescued the derailed streetcar in the morning and had to pull it back to the shops. Uh, I, I just thought this was kind of an interesting story, just a, a funny way to start service on this line. And then uh, another route extension occurred here. This is um, this was this happened. This is a Burke's edition route uh, in 1907, and so this route uh, went to UNR. It went up at Sierra Street and then made a right onto 9th Street and headed to the the camp the U the University of Nevada campus at Center Street at the Center Street entrance. Um, and then another extension occurred in August of 1907. Uh, this 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 was constructed to connect uh, to the Nevada Interurban, which we'll talk about later. But this headed down Virginia Street, and then west on California Avenue to Plumas Street. Um, and then there's the Orange Line here. This is the extension in 1909-1910. And so this extension uh, went to the Wells neighborhood um, on, on Wells Avenue. There was a, it was a new urban development in that area. And so they wanted a streetcar line to connect it to that area. Also, there was this Brown route here, the, this route in Brown in 1910. This headed down 4th Street uh, West to Ralston Street where it turned north. And then it stopped uh, at the west end of what is say the St. Mary's Hospital complex and it ended about a block south of present day I-80. Um, and finally, there was one last route. This is this route here is called the Fairgrounds, the Fairgrounds line. This was a temporary route built uh, every summer to connect the Fairgrounds to the to the, the Reno Sparks line. And so then they would they would open this route in the beginning of the season and then they would close it at the end of the summer, tear up the track and then uh, relay it the next, the next season. And the total amount of track that the Reno streetcars had was 7.5 miles. And then this is, a, this is an example of a Reno Traction Company schedule uh, from this time period from around 1910. So on the Sparks line, you'd have a uh, half hourly service between 6.30 a.m. and 8 p.m. and then every hour until midnight. And then on Saturdays, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, on those nights, additional cars would leave at 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. in each direction. Um, and so the first car would leave Sparks at 6.30 a.m. The last car would leave Reno at midnight. And then uh, the last car would leave Sparks at 12.30 a.m. And you can kind of see the different schedules for the second street line, the fourth street line, and the University and Berks edition line too. Um, six cars handle most of the service each day. There are two cars on the Sparks line and then one on each of the other traction lines. And so this is an example of a, a Reno streetcar on Sierra Street uh, on the plaza, which would be uh, just before we would cross the Southern Pacific tracks. Um, so 80% of Reno Traction Company's business was on the Sparks line, which this is. And uh, the traffic consisted mostly of shoppers and uh, commuters. Um, and then here's an example of a, a streetcar getting ready to leave from the Sparks terminal. Uh, this Sparks, the Sparks terminal was just outside the SP Roundhouse. Um, and this train was, a, this. Uh, this streetcar was about to head west to Reno. Um, one option was to take the streetcar to Wheelands Park, which, uh, which is also known as Coney Island. And so this was one of the destinations you could go to on the weekends, uh, which was uh, Coney Island. Um, so Wheelands Park was later renamed to Coney Island, and it was approximately halfway between Reno and Sparks. 
The streetcar fare from Reno or Sparks to Coney Island was five cents. And when visitors got there, uh, they could listen to live music, go on rides, launch rowboats, uh, take in the boat races, and there was a tug of war every day at 4 p.m. Uh, families were encouraged to pack lunches and spend the day. Uh, because commuters and shoppers mostly used the line Monday through Friday, uh, amusement parks like Coney Island were a great way for transit companies to make, to make money on weekends. Um, the decline of the Reno Traction Company happened around 1917. Uh, annual revenues for the Reno Traction Company were approximately $10,000 and expenses were $18,000. In 1919, uh, Reno Traction petitioned the Public Service Commission to abandon all lines except for Reno to Sparks. Despite protests and a Nevada Supreme Court challenge, the Public Service Commission granted permission to, to abandon the lines on January 15th, 1920. So all of the Reno all the Reno Traction Company lines except between Reno and Sparks were abandoned in 1920. Um, one thing I do find interesting about this photo, uh, if you can see the, um, if you can look in the car there, I believe there, I believe that's uh, a board that was used by Native Americans to carry babies. I believe that's what that is in the window there. So I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, piece to this photo here. Um, I, I, but I, I don't have all, I don't have a lot of information about that. I, I don't know much about Native American history, but um, I just thought that was a really cool uh, object um, in the window there. Well, the Reno Traction Company continued to decline into the 1920s. Um, the Public Service Commission received numerous complaints about unclean cars and cold winds entering the cars during the winter months. In 1925, the terminus in Reno was cut back from the SP Depot to Sierra and 4th Streets based on a Reno, Reno City Council suggestion. And the Reno Traction Company liked this suggestion since it was losing money and wanted out of the streetcar business. So if they could cut back their service from the SV Depot, which is where most of their service went, um, that meant fewer passengers. And the fewer passengers meant um, you wouldn't have to have the service much longer. So uh, part the, so the ridership continued to decline sharply after that. And then on June 15th, 1927, buses started operating on the route between Sparks and Reno. Um, this sounded the death knell for Reno traction. And on September 2nd, 1927, the Public Service Commission allowed the Reno Traction Company to abandon service between Sparks and Reno. Um, so the final, the final streetcar operations were on September 6th, uh, 1927. Um, one of the interesting stories too is that the uh, Reno Traction Company would not go quietly into the night. Um, during the final run into Sparks at around midnight, the motorman tied down the whistle for the last few minutes of the run. And this made many residents along the route very unhappy with the motorman's decision. The police came out and told them to stop blowing the whistle, uh, but it didn't really matter at that point because they were done with their operations anyway. So while the residents along the route were very upset, uh, the passengers certainly approved of the motorman's uh, decision. <laughs> And next, we'll talk about inner urbans. Um, so, inner urbans were a little bit different than streetcars, and they weren't necessarily trains or like passenger trains. Inner urbans were more like hybrids of streetcars and passenger trains. They were bigger than streetcars, but smaller than steam trains. Um, inner urbans were inner urbans used electricity, similar to streetcar lines. Um, and also, inner urbans could operate on city streets or on private rights of way in rural areas. Inner urbans operated more like transit systems and could be used to connect nearby destinations several miles away with fast, frequent service to a nearby city. Because streetcars operated within cities and steam trains operated between major cities, 
uh, and they had branch lines throughout the nation. Um, interurbans, the interurbans were able to fill a gap in regional transportation that was impractical for streetcars or steam trains to provide. Um, America's first interurban was the Newark, the Newark and Granville Street Railway in Ohio, which opened in December of 1889. And then by 1916, interurban route mileage peaked at 15,580 miles in the United States, with most of the routes in the Midwest. Um, so the photo that I, I've included here is not of a Nevada railway, obviously, um, but this is a photo of a Pacific Electric interurban. And so this gives you an example of what a traditional interurban would have looked like. Um, so these are the, the cars are a little bit bigger than street cars, but they're not quite the size of a passenger car on a steam railroad. And you have the, the they're self-propelled. They can basically run anywhere. I mean, it's running right next to the, they're running right on the beach in this scene. Um, so they could kind of go in places that steam railroads or street cars could not go. Um, and the Pacific Electric is probably one of the best examples of interurbans in the United States. Um, the, the system at its peak had over 1,000 miles of track covering all of Southern California. Um, but by the time, uh, but the railroad eventually uh, was, uh, the Pacific Electric was eventually abandoned in 1960 and all the routes were converted over to buses. Um, and I think that uh, many of us who have visited LA it could agree that it would be great to have Pacific Electric cars uh, around these days to get around. <laughs> um, they were very convenient and they covered virtually all over LA. So this is one of the major examples on the west coast of, or in the west of interurbans in our area. And so now we'll talk about interurbans in Nevada. Um, we had a lot, we had several proposed routes. Uh, there was a, a proposed route to Steamboat Hot Springs. There was another proposal for the Riverside Railroad Company, which would, which would have had headed west of Reno. Um, there were also numerous, uh, numerous proposals to go to Lake Tahoe and in the Tahoe Basin. And there was another one in Fallon called the Fallon Electric Railroad. However, of all of these railroads, only one was completed, and that was the Nevada Interurban. So I'll start with the line to, to Steamboat Hot Springs. Um, one of the first proposals for an interurban Nevada was a line from Reno to Steamboat Hot Springs. Uh, Captain J.W. Hopkins received a franchise to build an electric railway to Steamboat Springs in December of 1903. And he had planned to develop a hotel there, and that would connect so that way, that way you could connect downtown Reno to the hot springs with to the hotel with the inner urban. Um, but the project stalled for several years. So Hopkins then sold the development in August of 1907 to George Fenix. He was a local and he was a local developer in Reno. Uh, Fenix had grand plans to include a sanatorium at Steamboat as well. But unfortunately all of the plans uh, for the, for the hot springs and the interurban didn't go anywhere. Um, then in 1908, Fenix talked of building an electric railroad to, to the new mining camp, to the new mining developments up at Jumbo. Um, so these would have been just outside of Virginia City um, in that region. And so he wanted to build a, an interurban, an electric railroad to, uh, to gain that mining traffic. Well, the Virginia and Truckee Railroad was very unhappy to hear about the, these plans. So VNT management regarded this, could be, this was because the VNT management regarded this area as their territory. Um, so the VNT stepped in and announced they would electrify their route to Carson City. Um, so they were planning, so they, the Virginia and Truckee decided, well, we're gonna, electrify our railway all, all the way from Reno to Carson City and turn it into an electric system. And this was in an effort to block the, the Steamboat Springs promoters. Um, so when this announcement came out, uh, this effectively ended all discussion of, of an interurban to Jumbo and Steamboat. And as, we, as most of us or all of us know, 
the VAT never electrified its railroad and the interurban to steamboat and jumble were never constructed. Um, another project that was uh, discussed was the Riverside Railroad Company. And um, in 1906, the Riverside Railroad Company proposed a route between Keystone Avenue and Lawton Springs, Lawton Springs, west of Reno. Um, eventually, the proposal was scaled back to Mayberry Ranch, which is near McCarran and Mayberry. Um, in 1907, bridge piers were installed near present-day Idlewild Park and 2,000 feet of trackway. Um, unfortunately, this project never moved beyond that and eventually faded. Um, so this is a photo uh, from Idlewild Park um, across, facing across the Truckee River towards uh, the intersection of like Second Street and Dickerson Road where that, where that comes together. And so this was the spot that I approximated would have been where the bridge would have been constructed from Idlewild Park to present day Idlewild Park all the way across the Truckee River to Second Avenue and then on to Keystone Street. And then there are several proposals uh, from in 1906 and 1907 uh, to construct lines up at Lake Tahoe. Again, George Fenix, who, uh, the, who wanted to build an interurban line to the Steamboat Hot Springs, um, this time he decided he wanted to construct an interurban but this time it would it would connect from Reno to Glenbrook. And this is the part I love about this project the most. Uh, this proposed route would have included a tunnel uh, underneath Mount Rose and followed the lake shore south to Glenbrook. Uh, I just I just love the idea of of tunneling a, underneath Mount Rose, putting a railway in there and taking it to Lake Tahoe. Um, I would certainly if that were around today, I would certainly take that route. But if it ever had gotten off the ground to begin with, I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> um, around the same time, uh, a group of Eastern investors surveyed an interurban route to encircle Lake Tahoe. So that would go all the way around the lake, um, serving all the different communities throughout that region. Um, and then there was another line that was proposed from Reno to Brockway near Crystal Bay. And finally, there was a Finally, uh, there was a banker and rancher named Thomas Rickey um, who had proposed a line from the state prison in Carson City through downtown Carson City with a connection to Carson Hot Springs and a line to Brockway. Um, unfortunately, none of these routes were ever completed. They were just all basically pipe dreams that never uh, were able to come to fruition. Um, the Fallon Electric Railway Company uh, was probably the one interurban that got the farthest along before it finally failed to. <laughs> um, Fallon leaders wanted better transportation to get agricultural, uh, ag agricultural products to market. Also, they wanted a connection to the mining district at Sand Springs, which was southeast of Fallon. So Fallon had already had a branch line on the Southern Pacific Railroad, but it was inadequate for the transportation in the region. So in May of 1913, uh, Dr. C. A. Haskell proposed building the Fallon Electric Railway Company with two routes. One route would go east to a development at Stillwater, and then another route would head south seven miles towards Harrigan, with an extension to the Sand Springs Mining District, 31 miles from Fallon. Um, the railroad would also use Edison storage battery cars and so these were unique cars. They weren't electrically operated, but they had, uh, they were battery operated cars and they could be recharged after each run. So you'd go to the end of the line, recharge it, and then bring it back uh, to the, uh, the beginning of the line and then recharge it there before your next run. Um, that to me seems pretty impractical at that time. Um, even because it's a 31 mile route, I don't think it would have done very well uh, using uh, the storage battery cars. Um, and also because of it, they had a shortage of funds. Um, so the construction work had to be completed by volunteer labor from local farmers. And then the, the funds that they did have would be used to, for major items such as bridges, rails, ties, et cetera. Um, so this is Harrigan Road in Fallon. 
and the 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 company was the the Fallon Electric Railroad Railroad Company was able to focus on uh, grading a roadbed uh, to Harrigan and Sand Springs. Uh, volunteers graded 17 miles of roadbed by 1915. So part of the roadbed followed Harrigan Road in Fallon, and so this is Harrigan. This is Harrigan Road today. Um, and so there's, as you can see, there's really not much of a roadbed that exists today for the Fallon Electric Railroad. It, it was probably covered over by the highway at some point. And then this is a view of the, of, this is a view from the salt flats between Salt Wells and Sand Mountain on Highway 50 between mileposts 42 and 43. Um, the Fallon Electric roadbed follows the foothills off in the distance. So there's actually, there's actually a roadbed for the railroad off in this direction over here. Uh, it's pretty difficult to get to. Um, I was un unable to reach it, um, but I would I'd eventually like to go back. You can, see, you can actually see it on Google Maps. You can kind of follow the route of the old roadbed if you want to go into Google Maps and take a search for it. Um, so um, by World War I, there was a lack of funds for the railroad. And also there was an insufficient population in Churchill County to support the railroad. Um, Churchill County at that time only had 2,811 residents. And so this eventually killed the railroad. And then the scheme died permanently in 1916 when Dr. Haskell moved to Montana. So, and, and also in general at this time, uh, inner were falling out of favor at, uh, were falling out of favor all across the United States. More people were starting to use cars. Um, Interurbans themselves were just becoming, in a lot of cases, they're becoming boondoggles. I mean, there were a lot of successful interurbans, but you also had with that, you know, of all the, you know, you have a lot of routes that were built, but then you also have thousands more that just never were, never went beyond the planning stages. Um, and people lost money in these interurban schemes. So by by the by the end of World War by World War One, then the 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 interurbans are starting to fall out of favor. But uh, there was one interurban that was actually built, and that was the Nevada that was the Nevada interurban. Um, it was built in 1907 by L. W. Barham, and he was a former sheep rancher. Uh, the Nevada interurban. Uh, however, was probably more of a glorified streetcar than an actual inner urban. Um, as you as you look at this photo, it probably does. It's probably more of a a streetcar than it is an inner urban, just based on this photo. But um, the cars might have been a little bit bigger than a streetcar. And then this was the route of the Nevada inner urban. So it it followed. It went to Moana Hot Springs along Pluma Street, and then. At California Avenue in Plumas, um, there was an interchange with the Reno Traction Company, and from so from there they would head up, head east on California Street, and then north on Virginia Street to the uh, the Southern Pacific Passenger Station. And uh, the the Nevada Interurban's primary purpose was to serve the Moana Baths. The baths were at uh, were a few blocks west of Virginia, uh, or they, excuse me, <laughs> the the baths were a few blocks west of Virginia Street on Moana Street. Um, the Nevada Interurban took in fourteen thousand dollars in nineteen oh eight, but revenue fell to about five thousand dollars per year by nineteen seventeen, and uh, at this point it just wasn't very feasible to continue the Nevada Interurban. Um, in 1918, the line ended operations during the winter months due to a lack of business. And then with the Reno Traction Company abandoning its lines um, throughout Reno in 1920, the Nevada Interurban had no route into downtown Reno. So the last run to Moana Hot Springs was in October of 1920, and the Nevada Interurban shut down forever after that. Um, and then finally, we'll take a, one last look at uh, another transit system in, uh, the Northern, in Northern Nevada. Uh, this was the VT Transit Company. 
Um, the, Vien the Virginia and Truckee Railway was facing increased competition from buses and automobiles, especially after the opening of a concrete highway between Rito and Carson City in 1922. Uh, employee, VNT employees Frank Murphy and Sam Bigelow started the Reno, Virginia, to the Reno, Virginia Transportation Company on May 26, 1925. Murphy became president of the company and Bigelow was the secretary and traffic manager. Um, service began on June 24, 1925 between Virginia City and Reno. Um, on, on January 3, 1928, the name changed to Virginia Truckee Transit Company and became a wholly owned subsidy, a subsidiary of the V&T Railway. And so here's a photo of one of the the, the Virginia Truckee Transit Company buses up in Virginia City. Uh, VT Transit also had a connection, ha they also had a partnership with Crumley Transportation Company to operate buses to Totopah. And so here's an example of a, a Crumley Transportation Company bus uh, in Totopah. Uh, the partnership lasted about one year from May 1929 to 1930 and then it ended uh, forever. Um, so this is an example of one of the, of a Virginia Truckee Transit Company timetable. Um, so you can see they had a lot of, they covered a lot of ground in Northern Nevada. Um, so they had lines that ran from, they had bus lines that ran from Reno uh, to Carson City down to Hawthorne and Yarrington. Um, they also had routes that went to between Reno and Virginia, Virginia City. One route went over the Geiger grade, and then another route um, went to Carson City via Carson City up to Virginia City. They also had seasonal service from Reno to Camp Richardson, and that route would go over Spooner Summit. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of what uh, the service was like. Um, in these in this area at that time. Um, and also one nice thing about having the transit services was that it allowed the VNT to expand its footprint to serve more locations in Nevada without actually constructing new railroad lines. VT transit services were similar to the train services. So this is a photo of uh, the VNT, the VT service, the VNT transit meeting the train, the Virginia Truckee train at Carson City. Um, VT transit handled uh, passengers, parcels, and mail. Um, also, VT transit, also the, the services on VT transit lines uh, provided an opportunity to shift VNT daily trains numbers one and two to the Reno Minden route instead of having them operate from Reno to Virginia City, uh, which had declining traffic at that time. So they were able to continue to serve Virginia City via bus, not operate a train up to, up to Virginia City, and, um, and then they could focus the train uh, on their route between Reno and Carson City. Oh, and also additionally, Sam Bigelow purchased some secondhand buses to, re to replace worn out VT transit vehicles in 1939 and 1940. Uh, however, the bus was, the, the business was not very profitable and VT transit followed the VNT railroad into receivership from 1938 to 1946. Um, VNT vice president and general manager, Gordon Sampson was concerned about competition from privately owned automobiles and Greyhound. So on December 31st, 1947, the VNT Railway sold VT Transit to Vernon Durkee and James Wood of Reno for $25,000. Um, Durkee was the former, was Greyhound's former agent in Reno, and he had experience in bus operations. And Durkee and Wood continued to operate VT Transit into the 1970s. Um, VT Transit then became part of Peerless Stage Company, which no longer exists today. Um, VT Transit had some modest success, but ultimately proved unsuccessful from a financial standpoint for the VT Railway. And finally, uh, I'll finish up with uh, Northern Nevada Transit today. And so this is an example of uh, RTC ride. In 1978, regional trans the, the regional 
Transportation Commission took over bus operations from Reno Bus Company, which was a private corporation. Reno Bus Company served the area from 1941 to 1978. And the new transit operations were called RTC Ride. The transit service started with five used buses and four routes. Today, RTC Ride serves 8.4 million riders annually on 26 routes using 70 buses. The service area includes Reno and Sparks with Reno Intercity serving as a commuter route to Carson City. Um, next is Jump Around Carson. Jump Around Carson started in 2005, and here's an example of one of their buses. Um, Jack serves Carson City using three routes, and it also, also it connects with service from RTC Inner City and the Tahoe Transportation District. And finally, we have the Tahoe Transportation District. The TTD is a joint agency between California and Nevada governments to provide transportation and to provide transportation and transit services at Lake Tahoe. Uh, bus routes connect South Lake Tahoe with Gardnerville and Carson City. And also, uh, during the summer months, there are buses that operate from Sand Harbor to Incline Village. Uh, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to ask. Uh, thanks. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Adam. Um, Nancy actually already asked a question. She was wondering if any of those cars still exist today. Um, I don't know of any of the, the, the cars from the Reno Traction Company that still exist. I've heard rumors that there's one that still exists um, somewhere in Sparks, but I don't know for certain if that actually still exists. I, I think it's on private property somewhere if it does exist, but um, I've heard rumors of this and I've never been able to actually get any idea if it actually did exist. So uh, I was wondering, yeah. uh, as uh, Michael has a picture of the McKee car behind him, Mm -hmm. Were McKee cars ever used on the VNT railway as um, inner urbans or? Yeah, the, so the, yeah, the, the McKean car, uh, the, the McKean car that we have here at the Railroad Museum, um, that was actually used on the VNT between Reno, Carson City, and down to Minden. Um, so that, that car was in operation from 1910 until 1945. Um, on the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. And so it, it generally operated about three times a week. And then on the other three days of the week, uh, the, steam car, the steam train would operate. But yeah, so that handled, that handled passengers and mail uh, between Reno and Minden. So um, that, was, that was doing the same job as the buses, but on the tracks. It, yeah, so it, I mean, it, it would have been a similar service. Like the reason why the Virginia and Truckee Railroad bought the McKean car was um, the, if you were to operate a steam train on the BNT, you needed a crew of five. So you needed a, an engineer, uh, a conductor, a fireman, and two brakemen. Well, with the McKean motor car, all you, you only needed two, uh, two employees. You needed a conductor and a, and a motorman. And so those are the only, so that was a way for the railroad to save money and, but still provide the, the service that they were required to by state law. So you could, because they were at that time in the 19 teens and 20s, the, the service, uh, the VNT was losing a lot of patronage. And then once the, the last year that the VNT made a profit, I believe was 1923 or 1924, and then 1925, they never made a profit again. And this was because, um, in 1924, uh, a highway, a, a concrete highway was built between Reno and Carson City. So once you had uh, a highway, you no longer were tied to a railroad schedule if you, had, if you had a car. So you could just go back and forth between Reno and Carson City without having to worry about train schedule. So anyone else can speak up, but I'll keep reading the, t the chat. Uh, Dennis asks, uh, there's an a photo from earlier in your presentation of opening day for, I guess, the Reno Traction Company. Um, and it's dozens of men and boys, but no women. <laughs> yes. Uh, let me see if I can bring that back up. 
Uh, I'm just going to share my screen again. I think that's it. No, and I, oh, I closed it. Sorry, let me. Oh, I love technology. Um, but yeah, there are mostly uh, men and boys in that photo. Um, let me just grab it here. Um, actually, I'm just going to find the photo itself. So I think the question is why is, you know, was there a prohibition against women riding oh, the cars or? That's a good question. Um, so I'm just opening it now. And then I'm going to share my screen. Um, so yeah, if you look at the photo, yeah, the, I, I hadn't really noticed this uh, earlier, but yeah, it is all men and boys in front of the car or riding on the car. Um, that's a good question. I don't know that there was any sort of prohibition on women riding the car. Um, I, I, I have no explanation as to why there would be all men and no um, women on the car. My, the only thought I, I could would have is maybe these individuals had worked to construct the railroad and maybe they were taking the first ride I, I don't know. That's the only explanation I could come up with. Um, but yeah, that is definitely uh, an inter interesting comment. Um, so uh, repeated in the chat is a great presentation, Adam. They, multiple times they've said oh, that. Thank you. Um, and they're very impressed with your uh, historical photos and maps uh, and everything. And uh, Scott wanted to know how you go about accessing the photos and maps used in the presentation. Oh, that's a that's a good question. So I. We have a lot of these photos in the collection here at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. And I think some of these photos actually do come, might come from the State Museum as well. Um, if another really good book I would highly recommend is, uh, let me get it here. It's the, so there's, so there's this book, Railroads of Nevada Ooh. by David Myrick. And um, so Sorreros in Nevada, Eastern California, Volume One. And um, so this, I got a lot of information about the uh, uh, the, the interurban lines in Nevada. This is there's there's two vol actually there's three volumes of this. The first two volumes were written in around 1960, and then um, there's a follow up album that was written in about 2008. Uh, excuse me, two, uh, actually like around 2000. Sorry about that but they're all available through University of Nevada Press. And sometimes we, we get uh, extra copies of these and we sell them like the, the, extra, the, the original version. Sometimes we get uh, extra copies of those and we sell them in our used books section at the Railroad Museum. So if you want to stop by and take a look. Um, and also um, this is a, on, a, on a similar topic too, we're also getting, um, we're, we're acquiring a collection of David Myrick's materials from the Colorado Railroad Museum. Um, I'm actually going to pick that up in February um, if that, I get the funding to go. But um, but it's it's a collection of about 75 boxes worth of Myrick material. And so what I'm really excited about is that it'll help because we have the other part of that Myrick collection here. We have a small portion of it. But I'm hoping that because there's no index in this book or there's no, um, there's no footnotes. I'm hoping that when we get that collection, we can actually find out where he got his information from. Um, so we can kind of take a look at uh, all that stuff that's in that collection and I can match it up to where it actually came from. Because That's the one thing I, I like this book. I like these books because it's an encyclopedia on Nevada railroading, but there's no sources. <laughs> and so that makes it a little bit, you know, you kind of wonder, like we, um, I mean, I've seen other sources that he's used for other uh, materials um, that I, I've been able to find them, but it would be nice to have the source materials once we finally get those and we can track down where all these great stories came from. But yeah, so yeah, if, if you're ever interested in uh, these photos, you can just contact me um, and I'd be happy to show them to you. Great. Um, I have to agree with uh, Nancy. She said that the pictures and maps really helped us pick, um, 
relate to where those tracks may have been, mm -hmm. you know, in different streets in Reno and, and whatnot. I'm, yeah. I'm a map girl too. I love yeah. relating. Yeah, I like maps. <laughs> I like maps too. Uh, yeah. So a lot of the maps came out of the Myrick book. Um, there was another one that came out of, um, there's one from on the inner urbans that came out of um, a Nevada, Nevada historical quarterly. Uh, I think from 1983, there is an article by H. Roger Grant about um, um, about interurbans in Nevada. So I got a lot of information about Nevada interurbans from that one too. So I noticed, so I'm relatively new to Nevada. I moved here in 2018 and I was trying to plan my uh, return flight uh, from, you know, I, anyway, I had to fly back here. Yeah. Um, alone. And so I was like, okay, I fly into Reno and then there's got to be a bus or a train or something to take me down to Carson. And of course the Reno, the RTC has them at right. very, you know, only yeah. in the morning and only at night. Right. And I was just like, it'll take me two days to get to Carson, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> because, um, yeah. Yeah, there, there's very few options to get between Reno and Carson City. Um, I mean, yeah, there's the Reno RTC, which leaves Reno in the morning and then comes back to Carson City at night. Um, I believe there's a, there is a service that starts out in Reno and goes all the way down 395. Oh, there, there is one that like is that active that. during the summer right. for tourists to get from the airport to Lake Tahoe. But they, of course, didn't run it this summer. Yeah, you know. right. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, so they, yeah. Sometimes there are shuttle services between here and uh, between Reno and Lake Tahoe. Um, but yeah, like, but if, when it comes to like public transit, it's uh, very, it's very difficult to get down to Carson City from Reno. Yeah, they um, in Arizona. This is why I was like, there's got to be a bus, is because in Arizona, there's a bus that goes from Tucson to Phoenix like repeatedly like that's all oh, it does okay. and it you know it goes to the phoenix airport and then it goes to the tucson airport and it goes to the phoenix airport and it goes to the tucson airport um and so i was like there has to be something that <laughs> right yeah and i think and then amador stage lines i think they operated a route that was subsidized for a while but um between south lake tahoe and the airport but um i know i have friends that have used that quite a bit because they live in south lake tahoe but um that can get kind of expensive. I think those are like $40, $50 round trips, yeah. um, or at least, or maybe at least one way. But yeah, it'd be nice to have some cheaper form of transportation that uh, public transportation. I love public transportation. I'm kind of a nerd so, for that. So, so. Scott, Scott Carey says, uh, do you think we should have a high speed rail between Nevada and California someday? So I think that would go along the lines with digging a tunnel under Mount Rose. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, I think, I think the most, what would be, mo what would most likely happen is uh, between Las Vegas and Los Angeles. That would probably be the most likely route. I mean, that's been proposed for several years. Um, there's a, there was a route that was, there was a company uh, called Brightline USA that was, in talks of building a route between um, Las Vegas and Victorville, California. Um, but then you would have to get on Metrolink to get into Los Angeles Union Station. So you had to take a commuter train to get into LA. It seemed kind of like a goof. I, I like the idea of it, but it's like, why don't you just go all the way into LA? I, I mean, I know that was part of the future route, but, um, but anyway, so that was, I think that was bought by Virgin Trains uh, which was, which is big in Europe. Um, so it has some backing to it, but now I think it, the Brightline has discontinued that partnership with uh, Virgin Trains. And so now they're going to try to do it again on their own. So that would probably be the biggest, the, the easiest way to, to have a route between Nevada and California, but it would also be great to have one between Rito and the Bay Area. At least I would, I would ride it. Um, <laughs> just because I like trains and everything. Um, but um, I mean, maybe in the future, like if we, I mean, if you do, if you continue to have that 
growth in Nevada that stems from Silicon Valley, where you have all these tech. If you have, if you keep having more tech companies coming from the Bay Area to Reno, you might see more of that, uh, a, a more of a possibility of that. Um, but I'm also kind of excited to to learn about Hyperloop, the Hyperloop technologies that they just tested in Las Vegas recently. It's like a three or four hundred mile per hour system that uses vacuum tubes, and I think they. They had a they they did they have a test track at Reno that or down in Las Vegas that's about I think four miles long, and they put two people in it recently in a car and I think they got that they covered that four miles in like twenty eight seconds or something, so I don't know maybe that could be promising too. <laughs> so, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. I, yes. I, I I'm all for it. You know. Well, thank you very much. Um, for having me. I really, I'm going to get more local historians to do talks because I can't believe Garrett Barmore said the same thing that this is the first time he had done a Francis Humphrey lecture. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're going to, no, no it, it's great. So I'm, I'm, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank everyone else for coming. Um, so we traditionally do not have a Francis Humphrey lecture in December. So we won't be doing that uh, and you know happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas um, uh, the Francis Humphrey lecture in January will be Jan Loverin our very own textile curator um, she put together a presentation recently and she wanted to, to show it to us so we're gonna do that in January so um, yeah we are not sure here at the museum when we may open again it kind of all depends on numbers and the governor and numbers probably um so please stay in touch um i will continue sending emails out to the membership and to the volunteers and everybody um, but you know you can send emails back uh and um you know i'll like i said i'll send out the january registration one when that comes up so so we can all meet back again any questions anyone no i think there was there was just one more question that i answered uh in the chat um about the about the steam train that was at the depot in one of the first photos mm -hmm. that was um that was the former southern pacific depot uh i believe that one was built around 1890 um and it it was it was in operation until about 1925, and then it was replaced by the current um, SP, SP Depot in uh, 1925. Um, and so that's, that's still the Amtrak Depot today um, up in Reno. Um, so yeah, there were that, that site of, at the SP Depot up there, there were actually, there's, there's been four depots that have been at that site ever since Reno was founded in 1868. So that's where all the trains ever, like all the passenger trains, they've pretty much always stopped at that, that location since for over 100, what, 150 years now. So. Cool. Um, as I, walking through Reno, I noticed the little Amtrak sign on the wall and I was like, yeah. well, that's a bummer. It's a modern concrete building. <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, they've, they've, depots, they've made, but... yeah, they've made some changes to it, and, <laughs> but overall, it's the same depot. And I kind of like to think too that I, I that's where the the Virginia Chucky ran into that depot, and I kind of like to think of it more as the BNT depot. Like, there's still a BNT depot still in service today for Amtrak. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so again, thank you all for coming.